Okay, good morning and salam alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, all goes well uh, for the next hour. Um, I'd like to ob obviously express uh, gratitude and thanks to the invitation, in particular for Dr. Noshaba Murad and for her Institute uh, for Women in Leadership and Learning. What uh, the title is obviously with you. Um, the word uh, women, of course, is very, uh, uh, very popular nowadays, particularly in the UK. There's all sorts of discussions about the women's role uh, amongst the Muslim community. However, the subject of women is so important around uh, the whole world, uh, in every country. There is an issue of uh, equality and gender and all this. And I really don't want to intend in this lecture to enter into religious or political or socio-political uh, discussion. What I'd like to do is to just go into my own recent uh, journey into this subject. It's quite new to me because my interest has, for the last 20 years or so, was in the history of science and technology, in particular, uh, uh, the, the, the history uh, of those uh, fields in Muslim civilization. So uh, uh, let, let's just, just get on with the, with, with the subject. I, uh, I think that uh, what prompted me to be uh, interested even more strongly on the subject of women is to see the lack of uh, knowledge that is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, meager about uh, Muslim women's role in, 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 in the, particularly in the, in the Muslim civilization. Um, so, uh, I looked recently at a recent book, famous, quite popular, it's called Fantastically Great Women Who Changed the World, uh, authored by Kate uh, Pankhurst, and she lists those women, none of them actually includes uh, uh, Muslim, and in, I mean, it doesn't include non-Europeans actually, for that matter. So this is, this is a book, she has a timeline that brings the it's not only about the women that she speaks of today or even in the last century she brought a, a, lo, a whole timeline of history of showing women and you could see i don't know whether you can actually see this is a 400 400 ce that means just the, the year 400 having uh, having hypatia here of alexandria she was famous in, in her interest in mathematics and so on and then there is a huge jump to the year 1678, when, 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 she, when she brings in, starts bringing in women and, and, and particularly uh, European or Western women. Now this is, this is very strange. There's a, there's a huge gap of 1200 years here of missing information. Now, uh, of course, uh, if you go to Google like I did and write women in science, you'll find that the same problem. I mean, you've got mainly those great achievements have been made by women in the subject are Western, you know, white women. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm startled because this totally ignores the contributions of other civilizations. And in particular, those who contributed in the, in the golden age of Muslim civilization. So, uh, that brings me to the subject that, that is not just a question of women uh, from other cultures and that their contribution. There is a, a problem with men as well, because when you look at popular books uh, about inventors and, and history of science and technology, uh, like I did some years back, uh, looking at this particular book, which is, uh, says scientists and inventors. It looks at the people who made technology from the earliest times to the present day. Now, of course, you'd expect, ah, this is really fascinating. It's a coffee table uh, book. Uh, the size is, is large and, and you, with, full of pictures. What it has is that it has every two pages are devoted to a, an inventor uh, from you know, the beginning of times. So that you have the name, some sketches, and his or her contribution. In fact, saying her, there is not a single lady in this whole timeline, whole book. So let's look at what, what we have here. We, we turn pages and you get to page 14. 
which starts with Archimedes. And as you see here, the, the time of Archimedes is 287 from 212 BC to 280. Now, this, this, this time is important because it's, it's quite a distance uh, back in history. When you go to the next page, which is page 16 uh, uh, and, 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 and 17, because the other one was so 14, 15, this is 16 and 17, and you get Johannes Gutenberg. And you can see the time. I don't know whether you can actually see it. I'll try to enlarge it for you. It's 1400 to 14. Now, this is incredible. A huge leap. Not a single person is mentioned there. And of course, uh, we call that the uh, uh, sometime. And then they go to the, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. You have uh, the year 1452. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, in summary, in summary, you can actually put a graph uh, of, uh, of a timeline showing contributions of various scientists and, and inventors from the whole world out of this book. In fact, it is also applicable to most of the curriculum in schools and early university years in the subjects of science, uh, medicine, uh, chemistry, and, bio and biology, uh, engineering, uh, mathematics, um, and, and so you, you actually could summarize this whole law by drawing a graph like I have here showing you. Science and technology are taught by many education systems, and this includes where you are in Pakistan. You go and look at your books, then when you actually look at the physics book and you, you, you start picking up names from the first page all the way to the end, you will find that they're mainly you know, starting from the Greek, and then you end up with, <coughs> with a big gap to the Renaissance in Europe, and then the Industrial Revolution, and then our modern time. So this is, this is an issue, because we call that the Dark Ages, you know, the sort of, uh, we call it, I don't call it, but many people do call that. Well, that means there was nothing happening effectively in the world in that time. And that was actually true, perhaps, for Europe, although some people dispute that, because when you include Muslim Spain, the, the Andalus in there, then you will find that it was actually Europe was quite bright, you know, it wasn't that dark after all. Let us look at if we were to fill this gap with, with knowledge about what the rest have done, like what the Persians have done, the, 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 the Chinese, the Indian and so on, and include the Muslims, you'll find that this gap in history disappears. Actually, knowledge, in science, technology, in medicine, leadership, so it's all continuous and it accumulates. People do benefit from the experience of their predecessor, predecessors. And, and hence, humanity as a whole can claim and celebrate their progress rather than ex being exclusive only to Europe. And then you'll find that in Europe, there was a big dank period. But in fact, when you come to focus carefully about Europe, you'll find that there is a period in here which is called Al-Andalus period. And that's almost filling in that gap. It's just incredible of seven centuries, more than seven centuries of, uh, of the Muslim civilization predominant in the Iberian Peninsula, named at the time by Al-Andalus, has been ignored. So uh, this is really a great pity. So this amnesia, therefore, is not just valid for women. It seems that it is valid for men. Now, I tried to accumulate in one slide about 600 names of, you can't read them. I just, you just find white, uh, you find white names and there are different colors of uh, showing the Christian, Hindu, uh, and, 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 and so on. This, this slide, I can give you the names in detail and the, and the, and the, and the, and the details about each name. But actually shows you there are a huge number. I mean, there's about 600 of names that are missing, and they really should be in that gap to be recognized. In fact, they, some of them, if you use the, the rules of Nobel laureates and, and, and uh, the Fellowship of the Royal Society, they will quite easily fit there. So let's move on. And of course, that included, included not only men, it included women, and it included different uh, uh, faiths and non-faiths in the, and the, who lived in that in that period of Muslim civilization. 
Now, is this uh, a question? Is it ignorance or is it deliberate? The, the, the problem is uh, if you go to the conspiracy theory and you go to political extremism and so on, and you just say, well, you know, this is really deliberate. But I must say there is, that we should not uh, be too extreme because there is an enormous amount of ignorance that actually exists in, in the knowledge because of lack of knowledge. There are, today I have asked experts in manuscripts and libraries and so on, in Arabic manuscripts, which, which records the history of science and technology, medicine and Muslim civilization. There are, at the moment, survived after wars and burning. I mean, some people say there were more than a million manuscripts was burned in Spain when the Muslims and Jews were evicted uh, at the end of the Muslim Andalusian period. And of course, in the, in the, when, the, when the Mongols attacked and ransacked Baghdad, it, we, we were told that, that the amount of manuscripts uh, uh, that have been burned, that have been thrown in, in the sea, in, in, in the river Tigris, made it, made the water look black. Anyway, what we have today, we are told that there are between five and eight million survived manuscripts. Why I say five and eight? Because a lot of them are repeated in, in one way or another. The, the issue is that there is only 50,000, around 50,000 that are edited. Now imagine the amount of manuscripts that we are not aware of what's inside them, or we have not read them because they are not edited properly. And, then, and, and there's an enormous amount for universities and, and for people who are interested in, in the history to, to bring out this. The, the problem also is further uh, uh, made worse is that then this 50,000, because they are all sponsored you know, when you go and do uh, an editing of a manuscript, it's a sponsorship. You find somebody, a philanthropist or a government or a, or a, or a, or a, or a rich man or a leader, uh, uh, they, they will sponsor the editing of a manuscript. And then, of course, um, it will then, uh, you only, when you apply for a grant nowadays, you only, you have to satisfy the grantee, you know, the, the grant, the grant uh, sponsor. And they normally decide which area they sponsor. So in those, if you look at the 50,000 manuscripts, predominantly they are uh, uh, about dynasties. They are about uh, uh, religious uh, uh, discussion and debates between various uh, schools of thought, and Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, and so on. And then you have also uh, an, an interest in, in, in literature, in particularly in, in, in poetry. And then you go into, you find, if you look carefully, you will find here and there some manuscripts about science, technology, medicine, and so on, and architecture. So this is really the, the, the problem of, of ignorance. So, so therefore, I wouldn't want to totally accuse deliberate colonial and so on. However, uh, you know, when you, uh, uh, look at uh, you know the present day recognition. You, you you are forced to think that there must be some sort of deliberate uh, effort to hide the fact. If the, if there is a an interesting list of uh, geological features on Venus. Now Venus, of course, uh, has got many uh, craters and so on. And the, 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 the United Nations, and, and with the help of NASA and so on, they have decided, because Venus is a, a feminine name, they have decided to put names of, uh, of unrecognized names of, uh, of, of great women from the rest, from the world. And they included the Greek names, Persian, Buddhist, Hindu, but only one Arab name, one Arab woman. And you know what? It's pre-Islamic goddess of the name of Alat. You know, many of you Muslims who study history and about Islam, that Islam came to effectively uh, eliminate the belief in, 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 in statues and, and believe in such diets and so on. And Alat was an Arab goddess, right? This is really a great insult to pick up this name and celebrate her. She was not even real to celebrate her as representing the Arab and, and Muslim. So this is, this is incredible. This is why one feels blood boiling because 
you know, how can you, uh, you know, not excuse those people who accuse, accuse uh, that the, the, there is a deliberate, uh, so I don't really want to enter into this because, you know, we don't want to get into politics and, and, and to religious arguments, but there we are, we have, a, we have an issue. Now, of course, why is this so important? Because it, it's all to do with perception. Now, when you say about Muslim women, when you look at this picture, yeah, you'll say this is Muslim women, because they wear the burqa, they cover themselves all the way down, and including from the childhood and so on. Yeah, so that's the problem of perception. But can we just go and look at what perception you know, tells us? You can err, because these ladies and that child, they are from the Haredi Jewish sect. They were, they're Jews. They're not Muslim. And so it's really, it's, it's incredible how much perception and how we get brainwashed and you get, you, get, you get stereotypes ingrained in people's mind so that, you know, you begin to communicate with the rest of the world with that sort of perception. And so do we really need to be, to re-perceive? And, and, and so what I, uh, first came across this idea of women in, in, in science and so on. I was reading Al-Biruni and then come across something very interesting. Well, Al-Biruni, of course, is, is an incredible, uh, you know, scientist, scholar and so on. He has written something like 200 books. He is from not far away from your, your university originally, but then Pakistan, Pakistan, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, borders of India. And <clears throat> So he really should be celebrated by Pakistan and he should be taught. Um, he, has, he has a fascinating life and, and he can be taken as a role, role model in terms of his attitude to environment, attitude to humanity and so on. And Al-Biruni uh, would, would mention the name of Rihanna as being a very important person in his own work, whether it is an actual hands-on. There was another lady, Rihanna, who sponsored a lot of his work, but I think in that particular instance in his books, he was referring to another Rihanna who, was, who has helped in, in his work. Now, if, uh, if you look at, uh, I was looking, trying to find out who said that the uh, earth was spherical uh, amongst Muslim scholars. Then I came across the name of Ibn Hazm. Now, Ibn Hazm, he, he was from the Al Andalus and uh, on, on, on the 10th century. Now, he is uh, known to be a, a, Muslim, a, a religious scholar, but yet he has a famous sentence, which he says, the earth is spherical, despite what others believe. And, and, and that is really startling because uh, many people of, of his time used to say the earth was flat. Anyway, but the interesting thing about his life he is, he is considered to be actually one of the most uh, uh, significant uh, theological Islamic scholar uh, in, in, in the early history of Islam. He had 400 works and only 40 of them still survive because a lot of them were burnt by, by, by the Christian Inquisition. Anyway, he was you know, in jurisprudence and history and in comparative religion. But he was mostly taught by women. He, he, he mentioned some of them, but there was something in the region of, you know, about 60 women who contributed to his education. Now, that is, this is really a fascinating, fascinating story. And that's Ibn Hazm. He has influenced many scholars after him. Then you come to uh, the role of women in teaching and producing scholars uh, now, I'm, I'm talking, I'm bringing quotations from men who are famous in, 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 in Islamic uh, theology. Now, Imam Ibn Kathir is known to all Mus Muslims who try to find out the meaning of the Quran in Arabic, uh, because he has the, one of the earliest tafsir, the com you know, commentaries on the Quran. And this is his handwriting that you see there, right? And he, in it, in it he says that he has, he has uh, listened, he was mentioning, uh, he's listening to the reading uh, of uh, uh, Al-Muatta, which is a famous hadith book, a famous 
book of narrations of the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he says he has read, he has listened to it from Sheikha, meaning a scholarly lady by the name of Zainab bint uh, Kamal uh, bint Al Kamil Al Maqdisiya, meaning from uh, Jerusalem, Maqdis, and Damascus, who lived in Damascus at Dimashqiya, uh, in the in the Hanbali in the Hanbali Hanabila Mosque uh, in Mount Kassion uh, in Damascus. Now these are incredible uh, references. For, for w women who have taught men uh, and contributed to their, uh, to their great education. There's a slide here that I picked up from one of the manuscripts, which is interesting. It shows a woman sitting on a, on a member, uh, like, like a pulpit there, uh, and we have men and women, you know, listening to her. So, you know, in terms of preaching, uh, then I come across, came across to a fantastic book written by Muhammad Akram Nadui. He has, he has written uh, a book first in Arabic, something like 40 volume, looking at women of those women who, uh, who narrated uh, saying the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now this is very important because this is effectively the, it, it, in, in, in Islam, the sources of knowledge are are from the Quran and from the hadith of the, the sayings of the Prophet. So you get something in the region of 8,000 of them spread around the world. They were like sort of traveling. I'll show this map because this shows that these women, they had resonated with the call of Islam for education. They went out and traveling from city to city, from Arabia to Syria, North Africa, Andalusia, all the way up to China, educating, teaching, you know, narrating in the most, the most, this is the inner sanctum of Islam. You know, this is theology, you know, although the word theology may not quite describe that. But can you imagine taking hadith, taking a narration from a lady, that means, and from any person, that means you have to trust their emotion, you have to trust their honesty and their trustworthiness, you have to trust their education, and you have to, you know, this is an incredible conditions to actually accept a saying, uh, to, to accept a hadith or a saying of the Prophet coming through the chain of, 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 of. and there you have here, uh, of, of uh, now this research, there's, uh, there's, some of it has been done in English when uh, Muhammad Akram Nadawi was in Oxford University, and there is a book which is which summarizes that. Although the original Arabic is really a fantastic encyclopedia of what is called Al Muhaddithat, the Muslim, uh, school, you know, narrators, the Muslim scholars in Islam by Sheikh Muhammad. So I'm not going to go too much into this, but we can summarize that women actually, I have begun to discover this and I thought I'd share this with, with you and, and, and the rest of the people, because it, women actually participated in education and training. The, the, this is probably one of their main the expertise, because what I discovered is that the real secret, if you like, the secret weapon of Muslim civilization was not men. Men were just on the front line. It was women. They were the ones who have actually held the society together and they have propagated Islam everywhere. This is incredible. Had it not been for the contribution of women who produced young men and women in a manner to resonate with the objectives of Muslim civilization, to improve the quality of life, you see that there their attitude was that those who believe, believers, Iman, has to be manifested and testified and shown by amal salih by, by useful work. And the useful work meant that if you are a believer, you have to contribute to the improving the quality of life in society. That was really incredible. And they were, you could see them everywhere. This was what they did. But then, it, but, but beside that, even that, on top of that, you find them in agriculture, you find them in the textile industry, and you also find them in science and medicine, 
even more in management and administration. I like to give you a, a, a word. Most of you might have heard the word haram, the harem, harim, harem. Now, when I used to hear about this, because I, I was brought up mainly in the UK, it comes to my mind, women, particularly of the sultans, of the Ottoman sultans, who were, uh, who lived somewhere and in the palace, and they get cherry picked to go and sleep with the sultan because they're all wives and concubines and, and, and so on. And such a disastrous, erroneous knowledge. Because if you go and dig deep into the harem, you find that when you want to go in the harem, as a man, you have to take your shoes off and wear what they call these wooden sandals, you know, the one that makes noise when you walk. And you walk into this harem on marble so that you cannot go silently. You will make noise and women inside it will know there is a man walking. And so they, because they, they, they don't wear their hijab and scarf and so on when they are on by themselves. So they start covering themselves when there is a male passing through. This is the secret of these wooden, you know, you know click, clock, clock, you know, these are called in Arabic, they're called qabqab. I don't know what they're called in English at the moment. It doesn't help my mind. But they are sandals, but they are made out of thick wood, which makes, uh, makes noise on the floor. Now, what is inside this harem? Inside this harem is the inner government of management and administration. You find these women, they are recording, they are writing, they are translating. They are, you know, the, the statistics, you, you find some of the statistics they do. I came across uh, statistics about how many eggs in a farm, uh, produced by a farm in Morocco. They are in Istanbul. So, you know, this huge empire, which was, you know, feeding a huge number of, you know, soldiers and so on. They were the inside, behind the scene, there were these ladies who are writing ciphers, deciphers, writing messages and so on, and running projects. And, you know, it really is just a huge, huge knowledge. I was so pleased to hear about that. So harem is not what is in our mind and in perception. One needs to have another idea. In fact, there's such a terrible attitude about women and, and the concubine and so on and so on. But of course, one needs to concentrate on scholarship. Management and administration was an incredible function besides the education and training, besides the agriculture, the industry, the technology, the science, medicine, and, and so on. Let's now have a, an artist impression of how women must have been, particularly at the time of the golden age. You find that they were involved in astronomy and, 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 and in, in, in geography, in, in mathematics and so on. So I'd like to concentrate very quickly. The problem is time uh, because there are, there are so many of them. I mean, there really is a whole sea of knowledge. There, there, there are those women that I'll come across. I shall start with uh, Zubaida, but then of course there is the companion uh, of the Prophet peace be upon him, Al Shifra bint Abdullah, who's a very famous uh, uh, lady. Then Maryam al Ajliya in the 10th century. Sutayt al Muhammad of Baghdad in the 10th century, and then Fatima al Fihriya on the 9th century in Persian Morocco. Let's just go to, get on to Zubaydah. Zubaydah bint al Mansur, she was the wife of Harun al Rashid. In the, she was born in, 19, in 766 in Mosul, but she died uh, in 831 in Baghdad. This, this, this mausoleum here is actually mistakenly called in Baghdad, this is the Zubaydah's tomb, but it is actually, it is not her tomb. This is, the, this is Zumurat Khatum. Uh, 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 she's buried there, and there are other uh, respectable ladies buried there, over there. But she will, Zubaydah is famed of doing all sorts of things, but she was an incredible uh, uh, lady in terms of management and in terms of donating and in philanthropic work. You see this Baghdad here, and there is Mecca and Medina over there. There is a road. This road is called Darb Zubaida. That means the, the highway of Zubaida. This was the Hajj, the pilgrim route between Mecca and Kufa and Baghdad. It was there at the time of 
you know, early before even Islam, but it was in a terrible state. And early in the time of the Umayyads, some, you know, uh, caliphs tried to uh, repair it and so on. But the contribution of Zubaydah is phenomenal because she made pilgrimage many times. She even, is, the history says that she even went by foot with her husband, Harun al-Rashid the Caliph, all the way down, the, th even through the desert. However, we call in our motorways, we, we call uh, service stations. She has introduced hundreds of service stations. And, 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 and this, uh, this, this, this sort of, you can't see this is faint, but here you have the stations in here on the road. And when, you know, I can't go into details, but it, it, there's an interesting story about the project, uh, the, the finance people came to her and they said that it's, gonna, it's costing us an enormous amount of money. She says, I don't care, even if the, the cost of each strike of an axe uh, to, 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 to repair the road and to introduce uh, 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 lakes and, 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 uh, and dining uh, hotels and so on, even if it costs one dinar, it's a lot of money, uh, for each extract. When she finished this project, particularly the one that was in Mecca, uh, she was presented with the account books when she was in Baghdad, the, this huge number of uh, papers and so on. She took them and she said, this is not the time of accounts. We will get our accounts in the day of judgment when we die, when we meet our Lord, when we meet our creator. And she threw all the books into River Tigris. Now, if, of course, uh, there's no time to look at this, but there are pictures of her projects. There are pictures of the, of the road, there are pictures of, you know, of the projects themselves. There are lakes, the reservoirs. Some of them are square, some of them are, uh, are, are, are round. There, there are uh, sort of uh, hotel-like. Uh, but the most, the most incredible project is to bring water into Mecca from outside Mecca from near Al-Taif Al -Taif and so on. The water to be brought from aquifers, from underneath, from high places, for hidden water in, in, below the ground. And she would bring the water alongside uh, aqueducts all the way to Mecca. And if you go to Mecca now, you can ask, can you show me, can you take me to what they call it, Nabar Zubaydah? or the spring of Zubaydah. There are, there are, it's, it, I, I, really, my mind boggles when I see this. The, the, the instructions, the amount of work she's done is beyond description. This lady is, is you know, she was phenomenal. And, and you know, in terms of management, leadership, uh, sponsorship, and, and I even also in her knowledge and, and her, uh, her, her, she was, of course, uh, we don't want to talk about her, uh, her influence in politics, because she was very influential in the Abbasid period at the time of Harun Rashid, her husband. Now, let's move on quickly to uh, uh, the next one. I will bring in here Fatima al fihriya who was uh, a young lady of the age of 23 at the time in, in, in eight, 859. That's, that's a long time ago. And she was in Fez. Originally, she was from uh, Al Qairawan, but her community in Fez in Morocco, they, they were called Al Qairawaniyin. But then, uh, uh, then, then, then later, the, the mosque that she built, uh, when she received a huge amount of donation, she built a, an educational mosque. And her sister, her only other sister, she, uh, she built a mosque nearby called Al Andalus Mosque. However, Fatima Al Fariya built this mosque as an educational uh, uh, attached to it as a, a school is that true. But then this immediately became a university and it's called the University of al Qarawin. It still functions until today. It is considered to be the earliest university that still is active until today. It, it started teaching not only Arabic and, 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 and religious knowledge, but also incorporated other natural uh, topics and so on. And the earliest PhDs come there, they, you know, people say the word chair for a professor comes from there because it means kursi, the person who sits on the chair uh, is either you know, a sheikh or a, or, or, or a chairman, or a ustad kursi, 
come with some of the uh, so um, it really is uh, is a huge contribution <coughs> contribution that she did uh, and this this university still exists there and you can one can go and visit it uh, and, and, and it's functioning uh, in, in, in in the city of Fez. now let's move on to uh, uh, sort of engineering technology and in particular uh, instruments what you see there is a uh, instruments that to actually monitor the movement of stars to tell you time tell you where you are and so on the most uh, famous one of them the, the well known is called astrolabe uh, now to make an astrolabe is a, is, is a huge uh, uh, sort of effort because one needs to build, watch the, move, the mapping of the movement of the stars and plot them on the flat because you have a, you have a, a sphere, sky, a hemispherical sky ahead of you. You watch some famous stars and then you plot those stars by using an instrument on a, on a flat plane and then you and the movement of those stars, the trajectories are transferred from that flat plane into instruments could be by held by hand or it could be even as large as the one that you see there is hanging on the wall and by dialing that on a, pointing it to a, to, a, to, a, to a star you can actually tell your time you can tell where you are and, and so on there are many uh, functions and applications of this instrument now we come to learn that this uh, young lady called Miriam al ajlia from aleppo in the year uh, born in 1944 she, in, in, at the time of Seyf al-Dawla, she used to make, she learned in profession uh, from her father and from an instructor as well. And that instructor, I think, is, was an Australian uh, Christian. Uh, she has learned to make astrolabes. And of course, that is not an easy job at all. And we need to recognize this incredible uh, contribution that she made. Not only her who used to use and make astrolabes, there is, uh, there is Fatima al-Majriti, who was the daughter of Maslama al-Majriti in the Al-Andalus in Cordoba in the 10th to 11th century. She became his assistant in astronomy and they have re-edited the works and astronomical tables of Al-Khwarizmi. Al-Khwarizmi lived in Baghdad and they were in Al-Andalus. So they had to rework all his tables and make them applicable to the meridian that passes through Cordoba, so that it becomes valid for their country. An incredible amount of work, it really is. The other lady in astronomy, who has is, uh, is, is, is also come to be known, there is a huge article uh, written by Kenneth uh, Johnson about her. He is interested in astrology, and her name is Boran of Baghdad. And, and um, he, uh, he, of course, the word astrology is linked with astronomy. And, um, and, and uh, again, her life story is very interesting and, and I'm not gonna get into, but she was the daughter, uh, she was the wife of Al-Mamun. Al-Mamun was uh, the, the, famous, uh, the famous caliph who had uh, effectively built the, uh, the Al-Hikmah, uh, Dar al-Hikmah in Baghdad. Now, the other lady in Baghdad was Sutaita Al-Mahamli, she was a, not only a faqih, a scholar in, in, in religion and knowledge and, and, and so on, but she was, she was also uh, a mathematician. She knew hadith, jurisprudence, literature, but she was known to be a mathematician. And to the extent that her knowledge made her become an expert witness in courts, in the, in, when a judge has a problem in resolving disputes of commercial nature, or disputes in assets evaluation, or disputes in inheritance, he would call Sutaita, and she would use algebra and mathematics to sort out the problem and show them in the court and how she derives them. Her mathematical work is also available in manuscripts. Now, um, there is another mathematician, geometric, geometrician, and algebraic uh, expert and so on, in exact sciences. Her name was Lubna. Sometimes they call her Labana or Lubana, but she was Lubna of, of Cordoba. She was the private secretary of the famous Umayyad Caliph Al-Hakam II. And, and uh, again, uh, 
deserves uh, recognition and deserves uh, study. The, uh, the, the women in medicine, I have to go very quickly, they spread throughout history. Uh, but there were early ones at the time of the prophet, peace be upon him. Of course, you know, let me just talk about the position of women at the time, the early years of the prophet. There is a whole book of four volumes called Liberation of Women at the time, the initial ages of the initial period of Risala means at the time of Muhammad and the first caliphs. This four volume was uh, describes the women and how they behave at the time. This is a fantastic, unfortunately only it's in Arabic, it really deserves to be translated into English. Now over there, he describes all many, many women, but uh, women were transformed. They were, they, they resonated, they, they suddenly, they became women or leaders, educators, they, they resonated with the, with the objectives of Islam. And not only as housewives and so on. And this was just take, you know, that's just an ordinary function. Although, though by itself is, is a huge duty. But they went beyond that as well. And they went into education, like I've mentioned, and management and so on. But their main was the, to produce the future generation in such a way that these young men and women, when they are brought up, they're brought up on very strong moral foundation and and their aim is to improve the quality of life and to help to the, uh, the humanity and so on so the, the earliest ladies in medicine there were people there were ladies called nusayba bint al-harat al-ansari asma bint uh, the, the 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 daughter of abu the caliph abu bakr uh, and and then zainab bin yaud uh, rufaida al-aslami some of them were you know medics they they would set up tents uh, in, 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 uh, in, in a war situation, they would go with the army, they would set up tents, and, they, and they, would, they would nurse and so on. A particular person that I like to mention here is Al-Shifa bint Abdullah. She was expert in skin disease. The Prophet asked her to teach other women how to do the treatment. But when the time of Umar the Caliph came, he appointed her because of her excellence in terms of knowledge and management skills. He appointed her as the health and safety executive over Medina market. This new market that the Prophet has established is different than the other markets. He has made special new rules in this market, effectively free market, not control. And, and so that the, 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 the prices and so on. And, the, and some of the capitalists, they say that Muhammad was the, was, he set up this market making history the beginning of capitalism what they mean by the beginning of independent market. Now, Omar the Caliph has made Al-Shifa the muhtasib or the watcher, the, 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 eye, the keeper on the market so that she would inspect the food, inspect the prices, inspect the structures and so on and gave her full authority, not just to report, but to actually execute and, and, and and that means that there were only there were also women in the market, and there were and she, she was uh, uh, accompanied by people who will even if need be they will punish the person who is guilty then and there without having to uh, to, to go and do a report. And now, going all the way down to the Ottoman women journey in medicine, you know, is, is, is a huge story. But in here, in this particular manuscript, there is an interesting picture. What we have here is the main gate uh, of, uh, it's called the, the Amasya Dar al-Shifa uh, and, 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 and this in Istanbul. And this image shows Sharaf al-Din Sabanjulu, who was a famous doctor surgeon. And, and, and he was chief physician uh, of Dar al-Shifa with two of his students. And look at the students. There are two ladies there standing on either of his side. So, Let's move on uh, away from uh, medicine. Now, I'm gonna run very quickly. They, women, when I mentioned that they were in, this, in the background of, uh, of management and administration, they were also in literature and they were in calligraphy. Many of those manuscripts that you see, millions and millions of them, they mostly have been written and the scribes were women. 
they, they were famous ones who had fantastic style, you know, the calligraphy. Uh, a lady who's famous uh, uh, called Al Ghassaniya, and there's also the other lady of Safiya, who were really un unsurpassed in calligraphy. They, they'd introduce you know, illuminations and golden embroideries and so on on those manuscripts. Uh, they were also in, 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 involved in speeches, in oration. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know in, in poetry. That is Shajarat al Dur. She was a mother of a queen, queen mother. She was, a, she was a queen, if you like, called queen or whatever. And she became leader. But her, her fame was that she actually was instrument in, uh, in, in defeating the Crusades and ca captured King, uh, uh, King, uh, King Louis of France in, in Egypt. And she was a very successful military leader as well. Uh, and and uh, anyway, and, and she, she fell from power in the year in 1256. But I would like to end my uh, talk about the slide that women also are found to contribute in sports. And uh, although it's not part of leadership and so on, I picked up this from a manuscript. You may, some of you might wonder, you know, about Pakistan women. You know, this is Uzbekistan and Pakistan, ancient. They are playing polo on a horseback, golf on a horse, horseback. And if you look closely, they are also not only women, but they're also men. Now, I don't want to get into politics here, but I think that there are some very interesting stories, more than a thousand years. I mean, you're talking about 1400 years of history of Muslim civilization. So I like to end here. Thank you for the opportunity. So one, we need to bring in awareness uh, to Muslim heritage because it seemed to do to either ignorance or deliberate, deliberate that this is, it is missing. Uh, you can visit the website that I've put out there, muslimheritage.com. There's how how1000ranches.com. There's also a new uh, website which brings in medicine and the contribution called 1001 Thank you so much. I hope it has been an interesting uh, story for you.